We're going to start with some mindful listening today. Get our bodies in the present. As you're breathing in, we're thinking about the sunshine coming in. And then imagine blowing those storm clouds out when you breathe out. Ashland is a community of about 8,500 people on the South Shore of Lake Superior. It's the place where food grows on water, which is the wild rice, the monoman. You can be one with nature, you can hunt and fish. It's the headwaters of the Great Lakes. It's magical. It's magical. Despite that, Ashland County ranks in the bottom of overall health, poverty and housing and alcohol and drug use and access to services. We've spent five years exploring uh, how we should approach students, particularly students with trauma. They're coming in with more stuff than we ever had to deal with. The poverty and the drugs really bring down yeah. families. Severe depression at times in second grade, it can start very young. There's a lot of bullying, even just racism hardcore historical trauma that our Native American students and community has gone through. We have students that have suffered severe, severe traumas in their life. We've had a murder, car accidents, drowning, suicide. Go kill yourself. When did that become a normal insult? There's kids that we've lost that they didn't get what they needed. We owe it to those kids to, to do better. The work that we do in education is not for the faint of heart. No, we need all the help we can get sometimes. We tried to think systemically about how do we make shifts that change culture. How do we take that priority of social emotional learning and continue the priority of academic learning and achievement and bring them together? We are so glad you are here today. It's going to be another great day in school. Good morning, how are you? Hi everybody, yes you too, Mr. Stricker. <laughs> Behaviors communication. Acknowledging the whole child and where the child is coming from. Having the mental health spaces in each and every one of our buildings. Being able to see a therapist here. I'm helping myself be able to process things better and handle them better. We have made so many strides and gains. It's amazing to see how much he is continuing to move forward and work on himself. Culture is prevention. It's giving our students that sense of belonging and connectedness. Are you able to harvest your traditional foods? Do you know your history? Through the AWARE grant, through focusing on working collaboratively with students, helping develop social emotional skills, interacting with others every day, regularly, genuinely, helps them find value in themselves. We're starting that path in a hopeful way. I think our community understands the challenges and is ready to take them on. I'm back in Kansas. Today just sucks. The suicide rate up here is just unbelievable and the connections that our students have with that. Some of them have been dealt with some things that nobody should ever have to go through, let alone a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid. Our kids are dealing with a lot of trauma. There's addiction and drugs and poverty. Adverse childhood experiences. The suicidal ideation statistics were even more challenging when we looked at kids from Bad River, Ojibwe students, and then students that are identifying as LGBTQ. There's a lot of bullying. There's a lot of inequity. It is heartbreaking when you see those barriers really get in the way of someone thriving who has a lot of potential. 23% of our students come from the Bad River tribe. We have another roughly 20% of our kids that come from Moringa Valley, which is a small community to the south. It's kind of a rural, agricultural-based community. And then about half of our kids come from Ashland. Within our district alone, 65% are economically disadvantaged. Poverty plays a role in the challenges that our community faces. The Bed River and Ashland community has gone through so much in the last few years. We have students that have suffered severe, severe traumas in their life. The poverty and the drugs really bring down families. I have students whose parents have committed suicide. Parents who are mentally ill themselves and can't get out of bed using drugs and alcohol and aren't present for them at home. And the students that I work with here are 11 to 14 and they're the adults in the family. Not wanting to be at school, 
negative self-statements, severe depression at times in second grade. Evidence of depression um, coming in at 35 percent. Students who are seriously considering suicide at around uh, 20 percent. Those numbers are really high and really painful. We've had a suicide from someone either in town or someone that was in town for most of their every life year. every year. Or at least a big attempt. Or, like, yeah. Or we have someone who dies in school. Go kill yourself. I don't know how many kids I've said, well, this kid told me to do that. When did that become a normal insult? Like, I have these kids, they text me and they're like, hey, you should probably kill yourself. And I'm like, what? And it's really hard to tell when someone's being serious or not. Yeah. Suicide is such a joke nowadays. You can tell it's a joke sometimes, but like, they're still kind of serious when they say it. Like, you're joking, you're like, I'm gonna permit that thing. Yeah. People like, yeah. it's a joke, it's a meme, but like, those people are going through struggles and they handle it by going like, <laughs> It's bullying. In middle school, it's been physical. High school, it's psychological bullying, tearing people down psychologically, emotionally. Mentally, there's times I think where kids aren't safe. Some of the cyberbullying, the easiest access to be able to just type out something really mean and walk away from it and not have to face somebody. A high level of the conflict that even just occurs in this building was started or fueled through social media. Even just racism. I feel like a lot of it's the tension between Ashland and Bad River. It turns pretty ugly and like the tension starts to get to a point that nobody really wants to be around it. It would be nice if we could all kind of push it away for long enough to get through school even, but we, we don't. Looking at the history of uh, what my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents have been through, hardcore historical trauma. That's something that needs to be explored even further. I think we need to look at the curriculum. It's not acknowledged in schools today. You don't want to have those courageous conversations. Making sure everyone identifies and knows it happened. It's hard to be an Indigenous person in the school system. To walk into a space where you don't see a lot of people that look like you. Gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual. Where are they in our, our, our textbooks? Where are they in our discussions? And that's where having like the gay straight alliance is really an important thing. There's kids that we've lost. I feel like in some ways they didn't get what they needed. We owe it to those kids to, to do better. My job today is working with the kids that have nothing else outside of school. I'm a parent, I'm counselor, I'm educator. Everything is landing on the school system. They come here for their meals. I mean, we have the dental clinic that comes in, we have the mental health clinic that comes in. You know, a lot of those things that people used to get outside of school takes out of those academic times. There's a lot of pressure for us to perform, to have test scores high. And yet the irony is if we don't do these things first, those test scores will never raise. You know, I don't think everybody realizes that that impact of childhood trauma, what that really can do, it really truly changes the brain. If a person's internal social emotional self is um, dysregulated, in turmoil, in trauma, they, they will not get to academics. Without good mental health, I don't feel like I can get anything done. We can't expect kids who are experiencing severe depression or crippling anxiety or even just worrying about, you know, is my little brother at home safe? To have those sorts of things on their plate and then try to pay attention to algebra or reading. And that's another kind of equity lens that not every student has the same access to learning because of what's going on in their mind or their body or their world. Not treating them as if if they're not paying attention during your math lesson, they're doing something wrong. Maybe there's something going on underlying that's causing them to be distracted that you have no idea about. Being a trauma-sensitive educator is recognizing that and honoring that. I would hope that all children could walk into our buildings and be happy and be ready to learn. That they wouldn't have all the baggage, that they wouldn't have all the trauma. They would just be little sponges and soak it all up. They would have room for it. Because right now, a lot of our students, they just don't have room to learn.
Having good mental health is understanding where you are and how to handle it. Emotional intelligence and self-care. Self-control and control over how your surroundings are affecting you. I'll always be in a place where I can move forward as long as I can admit to myself that I need help. This whole journey through our grant has shown how the community can come together. The district is putting resources and energy and time into figuring out creative ways to solve these problems, and our community is doing the same. You know, all of our wonderful providers, North Lakes and Bat River Health and Wellness Center, and Memorial Medical Center, SOAR Services, Big Snow Counseling, we have all these wonderful partners that are hiring new people just to come work in our schools. Counselors from outside agencies come into our school and provide services. Being able to see a therapist here because it helps me kind of realize there's things I can do to get myself here and even just get through the day. Being here in the school, I come to them. I think there's a lot to be said for meeting someone literally where they are. The AWARE grant has made a significant difference in just having that resource for outside counseling it was such a barrier with transportation and work schedules to be able to get students the counseling that they needed. They'd have to take half a day off of their job to come into town, pick up their child, get them to a provider, get them back and get back to work. The parents have said, well, I need to either feed my child or help them. And that's a heartbreaking choice to have to make. The equity in care that school-based services in particular provide, I think that's been really equalizing. You shouldn't have to have all those privileges in order to get help for your kids. A lot of my students have had mental health issues, and so I really kind of felt like I was alone out there. When the AWARE grant came through, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, here's some other resources for other students who just weren't getting access. In the past, a lot of teachers and guidance counselors were really stressed with trying to meet those needs. The referral pathway, Greta, she's amazing at taking referrals from teachers, um, other professionals in the school district, or even parents reaching out. That's made a huge difference. I work really hard with our providers to find out what are their specialties, what kind of kids do they you know, click with the best, what kind of personality fit might be the best matches for them and also some people that just don't know how to go through that whole process. It really is pretty terrifying for a parent to try and both recognize that their child is in need of some help and then figure out the right steps to take. Having someone who can know the potential barriers and how to get around those has been really helpful for parents. We did a lot of visioning and a lot of strategic planning to make sure that we knew what the direction was that we were going and what the steps we would need to take to get us there were. How to promote change and how to help staff make that paradigm shift. There was a lot of front end work that ended up paying off. I've seen the culture change. Teachers, support staff, be much more open to ways that they might discipline. Instead of wanting a pound of flesh, let's look at why are you responding this way and can we work together? They're used to being yelled at. They're used to getting in trouble for all kinds of things. To consequence them with a punitive type consequence is really not going to change any of their behavior. It's only going to reinforce a negative self-image. They're going to continue with it. So. You have to find other ways to work with those students. It starts with, I hear you, and I want to understand. Because when I can understand, then we can work together as a team. Do the behaviors go away? No, they're still present. But we're able to work in a different way with the students, collaboratively, uh, to say, we value what you're experiencing. We all went around and talked about what we appreciated about this student. And when I said, what did you hear? He was like, I just feel like everyone really cares about me. And he was beaming. And the parents were beaming, and the teachers beaming. It was such a paradigm shift in how it felt in that moment. It doesn't have to feel full of blame and shame and guilt. But we got to talk about everything we wanted to go towards without spending all this time 
harping on all the things he did wrong. We do need to talk about hard things, but we do not need to do it in a way that everyone leaves feeling like a terrible parent or like a terrible kid or a terrible teacher, like everyone's failed. This is how we should be doing this conversation. We also teach mindfulness strategies. How does your body feel? Teaching them that all these feelings are okay and then what kind of coping skills help you calm down to be able to focus again. During guidance, they walk in and they have a magnet. They put it on a color. If a student is in the red zone, we talk about tools and strategies to get into the green zone and the green zone is ready to learn and having self-control. A strategy would be deep breaths, going for a walk, talking to a teacher. We give universal strategies and then they pick what they like. And one thing I really like about mindfulness too is we deal with um, students that have dealt with a lot of trauma. So it's a skill that we can teach here at school and it's simple, you don't have to have anything with you. If there's something scary going on at home or maybe before a test or before an athletic event, you can use it in so many different situations. Figuring out and feeling like they have control over calming their actual body down in class or at home or out in the community, those are the three areas I try to help them develop different coping skills for because if they can adjust them then they know they always have something really small things that'll help me get through even just a class period until I can get up, do the four minute walk that we get and then get to class again and then get through that one. If I look at the clock for 10 seconds and just breathe, it helps a lot. At a time where I'm getting really stressed, that's something I need to do. Having the mental health spaces in each and every one of our buildings is such a benefit to our kids and our community. Confidential, appropriate space where kids can get the services that they need right in the school where they already feel comfortable. It's so um, equalizing and destigmatizing. This whole expansion of the Wellness Center at Ashland High School has been incredible. The other thing that has changed immensely was just the spaces that we get to use as providers. I hesitate to describe one space. It felt like a prison cell. There was like cinder block walls and hard tables and plastic chairs. Before we would scramble for a space, a resource closet or room, these spaces you know, provide opportunities for a lot of play-based therapy. I sit in this office and watch just tons of kids just see refuge or go into these rooms and do their circle and work their stuff out or come in here and just take some quiet time. So the Children's Day Treatment Program is for children who are struggling in the school setting due to mental health issues. It's very individualized. We develop goals based on what that child needs to help them process through some of the trauma that may, they have experienced so that they can heal. Ultimately our goal is to help that child get to a place where they can manage and regulate their emotions more effectively to help them be able to go back to school and be um, more successful in a regular classroom. But because we live in a rural area, there's a lack of mental health services close by and so they were seeing students that were having to go a long distance away or be away from home for long periods of time. The school was trying to figure out a way to develop a program right here in our own community where kids could come. Memorial Medical Center said that they wanted to partner with them to help make this happen. We've spent five years exploring how we should approach students, particularly students with trauma. That awareness to the staff on how much trauma there is and its impact on social, emotional, academics. Being trauma sensitive is being aware that students are coming to school with things going on at home that are outside of their control and outside of your control and that are affecting their ability to be fully engaged. What can I do to support this child that's struggling in this moment? Or what can I do to learn more about what's going on in their life? At the beginning of the year, just establishing a very strong classroom community. Kids 
want to feel very valued at school and can sometimes feel singled out because of experiences in their life. So if they kind of have a clean slate to start, I think that's really helpful as well. For me, the biggest takeaway is to bring empathy up front and center, real genuine understanding of, of where someone is in that moment. I know, I have it for you today though. With like sources of strength, we see students who are going around and, and talking about mental health issues and wanting to do presentations about depression, suicide, gay, lesbian, transgender. There's been really an eye-opening and an awareness that it's okay to talk about these things. How do we take that priority of social emotional learning and continue the priority of academic learning and achievement and bring them together. I think restorative practices, restorative justice circles are also uh, really helpful in making those social connections more important in classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Because of some of the work that has happened around the AWARE grant, we've been able to justify having more activities that support Indigenous students, like lacrosse, drumming. There's a Native American club that I'm an advisor to. The high school has been putting on a powwow going back to like those basic needs of feeling safe, feeling like they can be themselves, they don't have to drop their identity. If a student isn't comfortable in a school setting, we're never ever gonna get to achieve what we want to achieve. If me being here helps with that, that's awesome. It just creates space for students to use their voice. We should speak and listen from the heart. I'm like seven because I'm tired, but I'm also having a good day. I was bullied a lot and now my grades are straight A's. Even when people still bring it up, I kind of tell them to not talk about it because it upsets me. <laughs> if anyone's having a bad day, try to make them happy. A good circle, and I am glad you all chose to spend your time. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that our community is recognizing these students because that's a wonderful thing, that awareness. But with that comes a huge responsibility. I see that 20% that aren't getting help because we don't have it or they don't fit into a mold of what is available. So I would really like to see us continue to adapt and be creative and figure out ways to support kids that fit them and their family and then you know, figure out ways to break down those barriers for those kids that haven't been connected with some extra help. Continuing to keep the fire lit on this thing that we're doing and supporting it at a high level. It goes beyond just getting the kids help and the family's help. It's part of empowering and educating the teachers. Our district is now committing a lot of resources into coaching, which will be looking at teacher practices, um, helping problem solve some of the systems that we're still trying to create. The biggest thing that we look for when we're hiring new staff is their ability to build relationships with the students that they're serving. And so you've got people who are fully invested in these kids and in these families, and then they have to deal with the tragedies that these kids are experiencing. And so there's a, a huge amount of secondary trauma that's going on in schools. Mental health isn't just a problem for students, it's also a problem for teachers. Yeah. And that affects the way they're teaching us because like all of the secondary trauma that they experience from what they hear from their students and all of just the stress of their job and they don't get paid enough. We need more mental health supports for our teachers so they can be more mentally available to they teach their students. They're schools are factory systems. Schools are white middle class institutions. Educationally, there's some systems that may not work that well for minorities, tribal members, when it comes to historical methods of teaching. Lecture, look at a book, do a worksheet. Tribal education is more group-based, empowering the students. Every kid is teaching something to somebody else that's younger that's watching. Having conversations about race and bias. Even if you're aware you have those biases, to constantly be checking your bias. Why we shouldn't be colorblind, why it's important to acknowledge people's identity and how that enhances their educational experience. If we're looking at students through a deficit model, we're doing all these interventions on students who don't 
fit into the regular curriculum. I would like to see us look at our students from a model of purpose and you come here with gifts and we're all different and we're not trying to shape everybody to be the same. Putting so much emphasis on the data I think is hurtful more than it is helpful. It needs to be breaking down some of the barriers of, of the classroom and of the building and thinking in terms of mastery of skills and validating some of the really awesome things that are happening outside in the community the important connections that people have to the land, have to their spirit, to embrace compassion. You're separating the heart and the mind, and I don't think that's possible. If we can keep those things together and we can approach the child for their abilities and their strengths and their heart included into their intellect, then we're gonna do a lot better. They're able to wake up and walk in and know that they're gonna be competent in the classroom, they're gonna have autonomy, they're gonna feel safe. Then they're gonna achieve. What would be really great is if Ashland and all of the other communities really could develop a great working relationship where the families and the students all were inclusive of each other and were able to work well together. Uh, unfortunately, there is racial tensions. These cultural divides end up meeting in conflict in our schools. It would be great to be able to knock that barrier out and have that not be a factor in what we do every day. If we were to take a first step, which is needed, we have to be able to come together as a community and have representatives from all sides and create a foundation of how we're going to address this. It has to be a collaborative effort. We need shared understandings and goals. We need creativity. We need to see different lenses. We need different peoples around the table. That will make all the difference in the world. The biggest thing is the identification and recognition of that historical trauma and the things that did happen. Acknowledgement. It is challenging to acknowledge those hurts, but it's essential to move forward to healing. There needs to be more education and some of those courageous conversations. Something I try to do more as opposed to my instinct of saying, eh, don't talk about it. But no, if it's important, we need to talk about it. It's real. We have to speak about it. We have to try and figure out how do we build these bridges. There's got to be an acknowledgement of where we've been, and that's just not there right now in order to be able to find a direction of, of where we want to go. There's just so much deep community work that has to happen to try and understand how much we have in common. You know, a community is really its children. If we can do our little part at helping the children in our community feel able to tackle the world in whatever way they want to, I think that is going to be all the hope that our community needs. There's so much resilience. It's incredible. Some of them have been dealt with some things that nobody should ever have to go through, let alone a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid. Most of my students are more resilient than I will ever be. I kind of think of myself as this like holder of hope. As these kiddos deserve it. They deserve hope. As long as there's that little gist of hope, you always have something to hold on to. I hope that the kids are seen really seen for who they are, that they are happy and healthy, they're safe, and they love themselves. And if we can do that, their brilliance will shine through. We've done a lot, but we have a long way to go. This role really opened my eyes and broke my heart and lit a fire. Thank mm -hmm. you.